Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. Welcome to Mining Over Canada. I'm your host, Barrington Miller from the Canadian Securities Exchange. And today I am joined by the CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange, Richard Carlton. Welcome to Mining Over Canada, Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Barrington. This represents a few firsts in our relationship. Uh, the most significant one being, this is the first time I'm interviewing Richard Carlton. Um, but I'm not interviewing our CEO. I'm not interviewing the, the, the king of cannabis and the sultan of psilocybin. I'm interviewing <laughs> Richard Carlton, the person who has a, a very distinct and just a great, great Canadiana relationship uh, with mining. And we want, to, we want to share that. We want to share that with you. We want to share that with our audience. Uh, first off, Richard, tell us, tell us about growing up in, a, in sort of a mining family or having a mining background. Yeah, so my, um, my grandfather, my uh, mom's dad, uh, graduated from uh, the mining engineering program at uh, McMaster University in the late 20s. And uh, of course, uh, I think not long after he uh, graduated, the depression hit, and uh, the, or originally the, the crash, then followed by the depression. And uh, he wound up uh, working in a number of uh, uh, survey operations and, uh, and drill camps uh, throughout uh, uh, Western Quebec and uh, Northern Ontario. And uh, I think uh, at some point here, we'll have some photographs that uh, he took. Uh, he, he, was a, he was an avid photographer and a Super 8 uh, video uh, movie guy as well. And uh, so there's uh, uh, a lot of pictures of, of him uh, on, in the camps. Uh, I can remember we actually had some of his old uh, gear. Uh, he had a down sleeping bag that must have weighed about 40 pounds. Uh, it was warm, but uh, I can't imagine uh, portaging that plus a uh, cedar strip canoe that had been uh, obviously in country for a few months uh, and all of the other gear, big, heavy canvas tents, of course. And uh, they didn't exactly have the little stoves that they do now uh, for camping and so on. So, yeah, it was uh, it was a really, really uh, rough existence uh, that uh, that they had in in, in those days. And uh he probably did that for, I think, seven, eight years or thereabouts. And uh, then he began to work um, in, uh, in operations um, for uh, a number of uh, mining companies, uh, again, in Northern Ontario and, uh, and Western Quebec, ultimately. Um, he was with the uh, uh, Campbell Red Lake mine at one point. Um, there's another gold operation around Jackson Manion uh, that I checked on Google Earth today, and it's just a scar. I don't think there's anything uh, uh, going on uh, at this point. Um, they lived in uh, Halebury, Ontario, uh, during the war. Um, my grandfather worked in uh, with the uh, uh, the, the gold and uh, metals uh, mining operations there, uh, also at the new Calumet mine, uh, which is uh, on the Quebec side, uh, just uh, downriver from uh, Pembroke, Ontario, and the Ottawa River. It was a uh, gold, uh, silver, lead, zinc operation uh, that uh, actually, uh, I, I looked it up today, continued uh, in, in operation until the late 70s, uh, so obviously a very rich deposit. Um, but then after the war, again, growing family, wanted to settle down in a bigger center with better schools and so on. And so he took a job with uh, INCO, International Nickel Company in uh, Sudbury, and uh, worked uh, for uh, obviously what was the far and away the largest uh, nickel uh, mining company in the world. And uh, I actually have some vague recollections of uh, crawling around in the backyard in, uh, in Sudbury uh, in the summer of 1960. And uh, I wasn't very old. And uh, uh, shortly thereafter, he took a job with Falconbridge um, as a, in a senior management capacity for their Onaping operations, uh, which was a number of mines uh, about uh, 25, 30 miles uh, uh, northwest of the uh, Sudbury area, right on the rim of the Sudbury Basin, uh, which is uh, of course the richest uh, mining deposit in the history of the world. Um, that's been uh, obviously heavily uh, mined by both Inco and uh, Falcon Bridge uh, 
uh, now unfortunately not in Canadian hands uh, any, anymore, obviously. Right. And uh, one of the crowning achievements of his career with Falconbridge was uh, uh, he oversaw the uh, construction and development of the Strathcona mine, uh, which was the largest uh, mine in the uh, Falconbridge portfolio. And uh, uh, it was such a significant event for the Canadian economy that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau actually showed up to uh, open the mine. Um, and uh, <laughs> wow. so there's, uh, we'll have a picture uh, of my grandfather. Sorry, uh, I didn't, I didn't the, mean to cut you off. For our younger audience, Justin Trudeau's dad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, that guy. Uh, and I can assure you that as a, uh, uh, as a mining operations executive, uh, my grandfather's uh, politics were not necessarily on the left wing <laughs> of the political spectrum. Uh, so a visit from the Liberal Prime Minister was not necessarily a, <laughs> a, a welcome thing, but uh, you know, he, uh, um, he, he bit his tongue and uh, uh, hosted the Prime Minister. Um, now, it's actually kind of funny because we've got a picture of them uh, underground uh, which I believe will, will be in a position to show, where they're in their, their coveralls and wearing their safety glasses and hard hats and so on. And uh, they actually went to the face of the ore body, and uh, they were showing off a, an, an early mechanical uh, uh, drill and excavator. And uh, so as they were taking the pictures, um, Trudeau says to my grandfather, um, I know how to work one of these things. No. My grandfather's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is actually a new piece of machinery that we've, you know, in all likelihood imported from, you know, Germany or Sweden or something <laughs> like this last week. But uh, in any event, they, um, so Trudeau said, no, 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 absolutely. I, I worked underground uh, for summer or two in, the, in Naranda. Uh, I, I know how these things work. And he walks over to, to fire the thing up. And uh, of course, he proceeds to stand uh, right at the outflow of the slurry because of course what 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 they did was they poured water onto the drill bit to keep it cool as it's uh, drilling yeah. into the uh, the nickel ore and then there's like like at the dentist there's a very powerful suction that uh, is 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 pulling the water away so the operator can see you know the the holes that they're making and and, and so on and uh, then of course it's being exhausted out the back and Trudeau managed to stand right where it was being exhausted. And so he managed to get himself covered with all kinds of mud and ore dust and water and everything like that, just soaked himself. My grandfather was laughing so hard oh, like for I'm... years afterwards, whenever he told the story, he was uh, practically in tears. He was laughing so hard. It's but, almost uh, as if it were planned. Yeah. <laughs> so the funny thing is, of course, uh, a few weeks later, the uh, uh, signed photograph arrives. Uh, and, uh, you know, my grandfather never displayed it. And uh, about 10 minutes after he died, I think my, my grandmother actually showed it prominently in the living room. So it was, uh, <laughs> 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 I, I think his, uh, his his votes may have been, uh, may have been canceled out. But, but one of the things that, uh, you know, people... Um, you know, may not appreciate about uh, how the mining business worked back in those days was you had these uh, company towns uh, where it was expected because you were, you know, out in some pretty remote places uh, in Northern Ontario and, and Western Quebec and in the Maritimes and out West and obviously in the territories. And uh, so the, uh, the company would, would literally build everything in the entire town, every house, all the, the roads, the schools, the medical center, the shopping centers, the curling club, the beach club, the golf course, the tennis club, the hockey rink, obviously, that like everything oh, sure. would, be, would have to be provided by the company. They also operated a uh, summer camp uh, for the kids, for the, for the workers. They had a ski club that they operated in the wintertime. Um, every aspect of your life would be provided for by the company. And uh, so, of course, my, my grandfather, as originally the uh, sort of the, the second in command and then the, the, the boss of the Onaping operation, was, was like, you know, they had a mayor. But, but he, he didn't matter. matter. <laughs> yeah. He didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, my, my, my grandfather was the, was the king of the, of the town. It was the, you know, they, he was at the pinnacle of, of this whole, you know, society that, uh, that, that operated. And so, I mean, just a, a, a crushing responsibility in many ways, if you think about it, um, you know, the well-being of, of, 
you know, the, 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 the workers uh, and their families and, you know, addressing all of the social issues that, uh, that, that come up. Um, and, and, and it was interesting too, because again, I, I wasn't that old, obviously. Um, I think he, he retired from that position when I was, I think, 14 or 15. But, uh, you know, Falkenbridge had uh, a history of uh, employing uh, in their operations. They had a lot of immigrants uh, from Central Europe. Uh, so uh, Czechs, uh, Austrians, uh, Germans, uh, Ukrainians, what have you, yep. uh, who'd come to Canada after as displaced persons after the Second World War, um, and uh, indigenous uh, folks. Uh, in fact, uh, George Armstrong's dad uh, worked for my grandfather, and uh, George, I think, worked underground a couple of years. And actually, uh, uh, years later, I met George, and I mentioned this, and I and I knew the 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 val the village where George had grown up uh, was on the highway between Sudbury and uh, and Onapeng. And uh, he, he remembered my grandfather. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it, it was, a, it was a, a way of integrating, you know, a lot of these folks who weren't necessarily part of mainstream Canadian society. Um, and it's a hard job. It was dangerous. It was dirty. Um, it was backbreaking. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it, you know, those guys, uh, you know, really looked out for each other. And uh, as I say, I think there was a, the real camaraderie, uh, you know, amongst uh, particularly, the, you know, obviously the men that were working underground. Um, now, the interesting thing was that right next to Anaping, there was a, an Enco town called Levac. And I don't believe it was, uh, uh, it was allowed for Anaping and Levac to ever play each other in anything. I was like, where is that game? <laughs> yeah. Because I, I, yeah, it would it would just deteriorate into uh, mayhem, uh, even if they were uh, you know playing volleyball or something. It would, uh, um, but uh, Inco tended to have more of a French Canadian and Italian immigrant flavor. Um, just just again how things had uh, had had worked out, and uh, uh, and of course Inco was always the bigger company, uh, so the Falconbridge people had a bit of a, sh a chip on their shoulders. Yeah. Uh, you know, because uh, Inco had more mines and, you know, bigger operations and bigger towns. And of course, they had the uh, super stack in uh, Sudbury. Um, they had the biggest refinery. Uh, so, uh, as I say, Falconbridge was a little bit like, uh, as I say, they, they, they were uh, an, an aggressive number two and, and really, you know, liked to stick it to the <laughs> Inco guys whenever they, whenever they, could, they possibly could. Um, you, uh, you, you mentioned... Uh, and thank you, thank you for that, and um, for that rich uh, recollection. Uh, I wanted to shift into the the economies a little bit, and we spoke briefly off record, but you know the the company ran <laughs> ran the town, and you know no no question about it. But let's let's take a let's take a bigger step, and let's not look at the town, but now let's look at the city of Toronto, and the city of Montreal, because you again touched on the Ontario and Quebec. Let's. How did mining help define how those cities came to be? Yeah, this is a really interesting um, piece of understanding how important the impact of mining is on the really the Canadian uh, economic uh, and geographic landscape. Um, as, as the Railways were pushing through um, Western Quebec and Northern Ontario. And that was where you began to see the surveys and folks with the uh, rock hammers were getting out into, into some areas and, and uh, you know, sort of seeing what was, uh, what was there. Um, it became obvious that uh, there were uh, tremendous natural resources uh, available for, for exploitation. And so uh, you had a number of entrepreneurs, mining entrepreneurs who were looking for funding uh, in order to further their exploration as well as uh, develop some of the commercial deposits that had been uh, identified already um, in and around the Sudbury region, uh, in the Timmins camp, um, around Naranda, uh, in, uh, in Western Quebec and Val d'Or uh, as well. And uh, so the um, uh, entrepreneurs began to approach the financiers uh, who at the time were largely based in Montreal. Uh, the Montreal Stock Exchange was the uh, principal exchange uh, in the country. Uh, it's where the, the railway shares and, the, and in particular the bonds 
issued by the railways uh, traded. Um, and that was really considered the, you know, the blue chip uh, exchange uh, in Canada that uh, um, they looked at the Toronto Stock Exchange as this Wild West upstart uh, with risky companies and scams and all sorts of things. And uh, it's kind of humorous because in many ways it's how folks in uh, Montreal and Toronto looked at uh, Vancouver uh, back in the day uh, as, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, less regulated uh, operation that was the home of all sorts of scallywags and uh, confidence uh, men uh, and women. Um, and uh, as it turned out, uh, the vast majority of the financing for these projects actually did come from the Toronto market. And uh, that uh, 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 leap of faith or that risk that was taken on by the investment community in, uh, in Toronto uh, bore fruit beyond all imagination. Imagination. I mean, many of the largest fortunes in Canada, many of which are still with us, and we can certainly see the landmarks in terms of the concert halls and the buildings and uh, public uh, museums and so on, um, you know, came to be as a result of the profits that were made uh, through investment uh, in, the, in the mining, in developing the mining industry in, uh, in Quebec and Ontario uh, and, and, the, and the first gate. So as this wave went through, uh, the, the you know, the First World War and into the 20s and so on, uh, what you saw was uh, Toronto assuming financial leadership uh, for the country. And really that center of gravity was provided by the successful investment and support for the mining uh, industry in Canada. Um, one little factoid I'll leave you with, uh, Barrington, because, uh, you know, back to my days uh, working in the index space, um, you know, people think that Nortel uh, was the most heavily weighted stock in the history of the Toronto Stock Exchange back in the late 90s when it got up to whatever it was, 32% of the market capitalization or something like that. Right. Um, that's actually not accurate. Uh, Inco, uh, after the Second World War, uh, was the largest company in Canada by a wide measure. And it peaked, I think, in uh, 1947 or 1948 at just under 50% of the market capitalization of the entire exchange. <laughs> eggs meat basket <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah diversification was uh was was a challenge uh it, you know because if you bought the market you you know basically were you were you were buying inco um but uh but yeah i mean that gives you an idea of the scale of the importance of uh you know because because again i mean you had inco but you then you also had all of the other um majors which you know some of which are still with us and and some of yeah. whom we remember by you know the names of the mining operations and so on um mining was obviously a massive importantly uh sector in the uh in the in the canadian public markets um sort of as we as we wind down and you know you're you're leading you're leading an organization a, a sort of uh an upstart, you know, the 16 year overnight success. Um, what lessons are, have you taken from, from growing up in and around the mining industry that have helped and shaped your, your leadership style today? Oh, there's a lot to, uh, to unpack there. Um, my mother tells me that I've inherited all sorts of, uh, uh, traits from my, from my grandfather. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of them is the curiosity. Um, I love to learn new stuff every day. And he was a guy who, um, as, as he was driving around uh, the back roads of Ontario, was always looking for rock cuts because he would take his uh, geo hammer out and he had kind of a hobby of trying to find garnets uh, in, the, uh, in the rock cuts. And as a kid, I just thought this was fascinating that you could actually take your hammer and, you know, bang a promising looking uh, uh, quartz vein uh, in a uh, rock cut uh, somewhere in the Canadian Shield and uh, come up with a, uh, uh, a gemstone. Um, as I say, I thought that was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, How many but, friends uh, did you have, Richard, growing up? <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you know, I, I had other, uh, you know, I, I, I had other social skills going for me, thank goodness, because uh, as, as you know, the, the, the nerdiness is not too far from the surface either. But uh, 
Um, but the other thing is, uh, you know, again, my, my, my grandfather, like many folks in the mining industry, uh, was a relentless optimist. Uh, he figured that with a, a sufficient application of, of hard work and skill and engagement with, uh, with, with good people, uh, that you would uh, achieve a, a result. You would advance your project, you would uh, get what you need um, and uh, achieve, achieve your result. Um, the other thing is, uh, again, he was a passionately hard worker. Um, what I didn't uh, say was that at the end of his career, he, um, he retired uh, from uh, Falconbridge at age 65 to the Midland area. Um, probably within three or four weeks, he was uh, pacing the floor and, uh, you know, looking, you know, pawing the ground and so on. Uh, but he got a phone call uh, from, uh, from, from Falconbridge. Uh, they have an industrial minerals uh, subsidiary based in Midland uh, that needed a managing director uh, called Indusman. Uh, so he uh, uh, took that project on for uh, three or four years, I believe. And uh, uh, it was a bit of a problem child when he took it on, uh, left it in profitable condition and handed it off to... Uh, uh, younger, uh, younger manager for, for some seasoning. Um, and then he immediately was tapped by a project that um, uh, Canadian uh, Overseas Development Organization ran, which had uh, uh, retired Canadian mining executives uh, going to um, uh, different part places around the world, uh, advising uh, different companies on new mining techniques and management of, of projects and so on. So he was uh, going to go off to Botswana uh, to run uh, some diamond mines uh, in Botswana. Of course he was. <laughs> because of course. Uh, and I think this was, uh, he was about 74 by then. Um, but unfortunately, it, during the physical uh, that he took before heading to Africa, um, they discovered that he had uh, uh, colorectal cancer, uh, which uh, ultimately... Uh, claimed his life uh, about a year or so later, um, but uh, you know he 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 lived every day to its fullest. Um, he loved uh, reading, uh, conversation. Uh, he was a gifted uh, limerick uh, artist. Uh, he he actually uh, uh, I think he won or finished second in a Northern Minor Limerick contest in 1968. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been talking to our to our friends at the Northern Miner to see if I can I can uh, track it down, um, but uh, uh, and you know he liked uh, he liked his cigarettes he liked his martinis uh, uh, he enjoyed a good laugh uh, so yeah maybe I didn't uh, the apple didn't fall too far from that particular <laughs> tree with the exception of the tobacco of course but uh, uh, yeah you know he was uh, an engaging worldly fellow who uh, had a very rich life and. Uh, as I say, he was certainly, he was a lot of fun uh, to be around as a, as a grandson and uh, was, uh, yeah. Well, Richard, on, uh, on that warm note and, you know, <laughs> seeing where the apple uh, and the tree stand um, <laughs> on behalf of the Canadian Securities Exchange and all the people that work uh, with me, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your leadership and Thank you for sharing, uh, sharing this part of your life and this aspect um, when it comes to mining over Canada. I've been your host, Barrington Miller, and today I was speaking with Richard Carlton. Thank you very much.